yeah, community ecology is all about interactions. When we go further into ecosystems, then we'll add abiotic variables into the picture. But for now, we're just talking about um, interactions. So, no. This is not working on a keynote, but um, <laughs> this little guy here, the that gull, it goes right into the, the store, takes out a bag of chips and then <laughs> leaves again. <laughs> so a real, you know, seagulls are real generalists. They've they've formed relationships with humans, wouldn't you say? What other kinds of animals? have that you know of have formed relationships with humans raccoons raccoons yeah raccoons like to get food from humans humans shouldn't really feed them but they do especially in the park yeah but also they go through our refuse so raccoons like seagulls are real generalists they'll eat all kinds of different things you don't usually find a specialist kind of animal, like one that might only eat one thing, to be close to humans or be able to live in a human environment. What other, what other animals are there that are closely related to humans? I guess this is like a similar situation to raccoons because they're pests now, but I grew up in Whistler and black bears are quite the, um, they're like, oh, yeah the raccoons of Whistler <laughs> they'll like break into people's houses and restaurants and um, go through your garbage and eat whatever you yeah. left and clean your barbecue properly or whatever <laughs> what do they what do they do about the bears there um it depends they do have they have like a whole bear unit um but if they are recurring problems they do unfortunately like put them down um yeah they'd they have to if they can't relocate they try to relocate them but some of them are really persistent and like to come back to their favorite spots right they're smarter than people think they are um <laughs> there are bears, some yeah bears are smart on the mountain there's some that are that haven't been introduced to um human waste i guess yet so they they're just happy eating berries and whatnot on the mountain, but um, the ones that wander down to like the main valley, they're the problem. Right. Yeah. So they get enough food where they are, so they don't they don't think about traveling yeah. elsewhere. But, yeah, if you spend like any like amount of time in Whistler, you will meet a bear. Um, the yeah. amount of time I, like walked past, I don't know. I was there a couple of weeks ago actually, and there's one in my the back of my neighbor's pickup truck. He had um he left his garbage in the back of his truck and <laughs> I just walked past it no. like and sitting in the back like rummaging. <laughs> Jeepers. The stuff you see. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what you want to be startled with. No. <laughs> yeah, so there bears are a good example. Um, human interactions with animals in urban settings. This is a snake. And it's eating a calf, which somehow landed in the river in this canyon. So that's, that would be, presumably the calf was already dead. So that would be um, a scavenger kind of situation. So some interactions that include animals eating animals that are already dead, those are scavengers. So the bears can be scavengers. Um, bald eagles can be scavengers. Sometimes they scavenge for very odd things. Like um, there was a case where, I don't know exactly where it was now. It's in the United States. And there was problems with the power lines. And it turned out that an eagle was flying overhead and it, it was carrying a cow placenta and, and it dropped the placenta on the power lines. So, um, Scavengers, yeah, they, there are scavengers. But a community is defined as a population of various species living close enough for potential interaction. So this is a savanna community. Which species would be part of this community? Yeah. 
what are all the species? Sorry, uh, the species in the picture, you mean? Yeah, would they all be part of this community? What are the birds? Are they like vultures or what type of uh, birds? Are you can't really tell. This one though, that one looks like a vulture. So it, they probably are vultures. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just waiting for someone to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also scavengers. So they're scavengers. Um, these animals are herbivores. Uh, most of them there are herbivores. They're competing for the water. So in some areas, water is quite scarce. So that can be something that animals compete for. And that's an interaction, just like scavenging. And usually this interaction has to happen at a particular site or specific area where the species actually overlap. And in community ecology, we study things like how are the species distributed? Um, how many are there? And what are their interactions? Are they predator prey? Are they scavengers? Are they competing with each other? Are they symbionts? Excellent. Examples. This is the kind, these are the kinds of things we'll be talking about in community ecology. Food webs, which you've probably heard of before, species diversity. So how many different species may be in an area interacting? Succession in areas that have been cleared, who gets there first, uh, who gets there second? Um, what is the climax community? Uh, invasion biology, we'll talk a little bit about invasive species and restoration ecology which is where you need to know quite a lot to restore uh, a community. Oh, right. <laughs> community ecology, well, this animal needs sneakers. You can tell these are Gary Larson. <laughs> this is a stampede. <laughs> I'm talking in a, in a phone booth. Have you, have you seen Gary Larson, the far side before? Yeah, it's funny. These are the kinds of interactions we're, we're talking about. Competition, predation, herbivory, symbiosis, different kinds of symbiosis, disease. And we could probably add um, scavenging. So if there are two different species interacting, they might both win, they might both lose, or one might win and the other might lose. And by lose, I just mean that their population size may be smaller or they may be pushed out of an area. So competition, Competition is one style of interaction. It can be detrimental to both species if resources are limited. So there isn't competition unless resources are limited, like grasslands. They only cover a certain amount of space. So you only find a certain number of ungulates or grazers in a grassland. With predation, one wins, the predator, the prey, not so much. Herbivory, the herbivore wins, the plant probably is detrimental to the plant. Parasitism, the parasite wins, the host is generally um, harmed in some way. Disease, disease which is caused by parasites like bacteria, and other microbes like viruses, generally detrimental, of course, to the host. Mutualism is a plus-plus. It's an interaction that's beneficial to both species, 
and commensalism, one benefits and the other one doesn't really benefit or lose or um, have any kind of reaction. Let's talk about competition. There are really different kinds of competition. Uh, Interspecific is between species, between different species. Like in the savanna, different, different ungulates or different grazers, um, the bok bok and the antelope. <laughs> I can't remember the names of all of the, the herbivores, but that's between different species. There is such a thing as intraspecific. competition. And that is within a species. And that often leads to the evolution of traits that make one individual in a population more competitive than another, like beak size, for example. Interspecific. Inter competition can lead to a phenomenon known as competitive exclusion, where there's a local elimination of one of the species because the other one is just much better at exploiting that area. So this is an example. These are two species of barnacle, um, Balanus and Chalamidus or something like that. I don't remember exactly the name, but, um, these two species are competing for the same limiting resources. The resources are, well, what are the resources? What kinds of things are these two species competing for, do you think? I should put up the chat so I can see if you said, written anything. Or you can, you can uh, unmute as well. Space, good, yeah. So limiting resources such as space. There's only a certain amount of space in the intertidal. And so the lower you are down here, the longer you'll be covered in water. Up here, you'll be covered in water for less time. in the upper intertidal. So you're more subject to desiccation. These individuals then have to be better adapted to desiccation. Maybe they close their shells more tightly or maybe their shells are somewhat thicker. competitive exclusion. These individuals down here, they, they live quite well in this kind of habitat. So there's a difference between habitat and niche. An ecological niche, and I say niche, I know other people say uh, niche, but I don't like that word, I like niche. <laughs> I don't really know why, because it rhymes with witch or another word that I don't like at all. <laughs> so I, I like to say niche. <laughs> and that is a total of an organism's use of, of all of its surroundings, biotic and abiotic resources. So habitat is, is kind of the organism's address. So that would be for the barnacles, the intertidal. But the niche is its profession. So for some barnacles, it's a particular area of the upper intertidal that has a certain amount of water coverage and it filter feeds out of the water, specific kinds of animals. So this is a woodland. So the habitat here is um, a field or a woodland field 
And there's competition for resources. There's soil, there's water, there's sunlight. So soil, water, sunlight. So the niches of these organisms are slightly different. So the grasses niche is shallower soil, for example. Um, the larger, uh, I think they're oaks, their, their roots are very deep. So they can extend their roots to uh, access water in different, different substrate. So their niche is um, Sorry, that's supposed to say soil. Their niche is uh, where, what kind of soil do they require? How much water do they require? Um, how much sunlight? Are they a shade plant or a sun plant, for example? Nutrients, uh, where do they get the nutrients from? Uh, deeper in the soil, more widespread roots? Or do they have tap roots that delve very deep into the soil? This is Walt, Walter, after years of searching, Walter finally found his niche. Walter is very shy. So ecologically similar species can coexist in a community in different niches, however. So they may be in the same community, but their niches are different. So uh, here, here it is, uh, Balanus. I'm sorry, I can't make this larger in this particular program. So I'll just write it larger, Balanus is these kinds, the species of barnacle and thalamus, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, chalamus, chalamus, it's very hard to say. Who spells anything like that? <laughs> they are the species that live in this upper intertidal end and um, if, however, you were to remove one of the species, what would happen to the other one? Would they be able to move into the area that you have vacated? And so people do what are called, um, they're not called exclusion, they're, these are removal experiments. And it turns out that if you remove the balanus, the chalamus <laughs> readily, extends its, its habitat. So we call niches two different things, a realized niche. So in this case, this is the Chthalamus's realized niche. But it could, if the other species weren't there, use this whole area, and that's known as a fundamental niche. So having different niches means that even living in a similar habitat, resources can be partitioned. So this is an analyst lizard. Analyst is the genus. But these are all different species. Analyst, Elinagar, Vestichus, Cybotes, Etheridge, Christophi, Enceletus, Recordi. Uh, they're all different species within the same genus. So very likely in the past, uh, there was competition for resources. So some of them developed adaptations to use slightly different resources in order that there wasn't as much competition and they had better survival. So in this case, um, the insulitus perches on branches. This one here perches on branches. Uh, this one hangs out on the leaves. Others are on, on fences or in the soil or somewhere where it's more sunny. 
So what, what are lizards competing for? So food, um, often they're, they eat insects and there are different insects in different parts of this system. So there'll be different insects, uh, sorry, there'll be different insects on the branches than there are on the leaves. So the, the difference between the branch uh, um, analysts and the leaf analysts is probably somewhat to do with their mouths and their tongues as to how they catch these different insects. They're a, a little bit different. So the difference in their mouth parts is also known as character displacement. I'll, I'll give you the definition of a couple of words here. You might not have heard it before. Sympatric means living together, not with somebody called Patrick, <laughs> but living together in the same space or very similar, similarly close together. Allopatric means uh, living apart. So here's some examples, three graphs for two species. One of them is G, I don't remember what the G stands for, fuliginosa, and the other is G fortis. You always have to underline them. Whenever you, whenever you write a species name, it will include the genus. In this case, I've just got the initial of the genus and the species name, in this case, it's Fortis, but the protocol is to underline or write them in italics. Anytime you're writing or typing a species name, make sure you underline it. So um, the x-axis down here is beak depth. So a narrower beak depth, a greater beak depth. The orange here is G. fuliginosa, and the purple is G. fortis. The y-axis is the percentage of individuals with that beak size. So this goes from zero here to 40. So character displacement means that a characteristic in this case, it's the beak gets to be quite different even within a population because they're going after slightly different food. And the ones that have a large beak go after the larger nuts. The ones with a smaller beak, they may be going after um, grubs. But eventually they get so different that they don't interbreed anymore and they become different species. That's called speciation. And that's happened in this case with sympatry because of competition. So these are, these are two, uh, these individuals living on the same island. And um, they've diverged considerably with respect to beak size. If, however, they don't have competition from the other species, their beaks won't differ very much. So this is Los Hermanos Island in the Galapagos. This is Daphne Island in the Galapagos. These are two different islands. This is the G. fuliginosa on Los Hermanos. This is the G. Uh, sorry, the G. fortis on the other island. And you can see that their beak sizes overlap. So they haven't diverged. There hasn't been character displacement because they're not competing with each other. They're not competing. So it's not necessary for them to um, develop larger beaks.
predation, where one wins and one loses. Usually one species kills and eats the other one, like this bear and the salmon. Um, what kinds of features, characteristics, do you think predatory animals have? What kinds of traits, what kinds of characters might they have? Relatively good senses. Senses. Sense of smell, for example? Yes, good. What other features? Eyesight too, right? Depending on where the predation is taking place. Pack culture in some cases, depending on the size of the animal, if they need to group together and and, uh, and stick together to, to hunt more efficiently. Right, pack. So behavior. Yeah, their behaviors are different than prey, aren't they? Although prey, we won't call them a pack, we'll call prey a herd. <laughs> but yeah, they do gather together as well. Uh, what about their physical features? Yes, hearing also. Usually have canines, like big teeth. Canines, yeah, big teeth for ripping and tearing. Yeah, and chewing. Do they have a shorter intestine as well so they, um, so they can digest faster? Yeah. Shorter intestines than herbivores. Good. Yeah, a physiological difference. Being able to digest more quickly. Excellent. Um, claws. Where's my picture of claws? I just like bears. <laughs> I think bears eating salmon is fascinating. I think it's fascinating that the bear can find the salmon. So, you know, salmon migrate upstream to spawn um, once every four years for a particular cohort. But every year there will be salmon spawning to streams. This one is a sockeye salmon, um, but it's just one time of the year Sockeye, I think, when do they spawn? I'm not sure. Coho spawn in the fall. I think sockeye might spawn in the spring. But there's a lot of water flow because the, the, the salmon have to swim up river. And so if it's too shallow, it's not that great for the salmon because they have to get up these long waterfalls and there might not be that much water trickling down for them to, uh, to jump up these, these small rapids and waterfalls. So there's a certain time of year. And, and during the time of year when there's a lot of water, there's also a lot of noise of the water. I don't know if, you, if you've been hiking and, and heard like a waterfall or a river or a creek or something in the distance. And you just know it's there because they're, they're quite noisy. So I think that's one of the ways the bear uh, finds the creeks. And also, of course, smell. They have these enormous uh, rostrum, schnozes. <laughs> And uh, their sense of smell is terrific. And they leave themselves a trail. So I worked out in the Keogh River on Vancouver Island and sort of my first uh, uh, encounters with bears, but from a distance, thank goodness. But their trails are all over the place. And you find you know, trees that are scratched off. So they, and they rub up against trees and they leave their scent. And that's how they find, find their way around. So smell is very important, yeah. Uh, yeah, claws, teeth, fangs, stingers, poison, all kinds of predator characteristics. Fangs of, uh, let's see who has fangs. Some bats have fangs. 
vampire bat. There are vampire bats and they have fangs. Um, what is the name of the snake with fangs? Viper, oh. right? There's probably other ones too, right? But the viper definitely has the fangs. Stingers, what kind of predator has a stinger? Wasps, bees. Wasps, bees. Hornets. Yeah, hornets. Good. So those are predator adaptations. What about prey? What kind of adaptations might prey have? to avoid being eaten. Camouflage. Camouflage. That, yeah. yeah, absolutely. An adaptation. Mimic oh, was I going to say mimicry? I don't know mimicry. That one. Yeah. yeah, that's one too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> have spines, like I'm making like hedgehog or porcupines and some yes. Spines. Yeah, porcupines, the echidna. They have those long spines, hedgehogs. Good. And often they have um, ears that can turn to different directions to hear where predators might be. You know, we have those, we have those muscles that our ancestors must have had to turn their ears around. Can anybody move their ear muscles? <laughs> Not everybody can, but some people can. It's very odd. Some people, my brother-in-law can. And he'll, he'll have his glasses on and he'll, he'll move his ear muscles and his glasses will go up and down. <laughs> That's quite funny. So defense mechanism. Yes, cryptic coloration. I don't know if you've noticed this year, but have you noticed the number of moths there have been. Yes. So those, right? Yeah. So this is a. Although, is there, a, oh, sorry, I think there was a lot more like maybe two weeks ago than there was like now. Yes. So. Yes, totally. There were so many. They were all over my screens. They were in the forest. And it was very interesting because I was walking with my friend Peter and I was looking at a tree to take its picture. And at first I didn't even notice them. And then I did. And there was about 20 moths on this tree. They're quite cryptic. Yeah, so yeah. And, and sometimes the cryptic coloration can be so closely matched to the environment, like this toad. Did you see the toad? <laughs> You know, if you just like glanced at it and glanced away, you probably might not notice it. So that is to hide, of course, but sometimes coloration is to warn. So this is a little poison arrow frog from uh, the tropics. It's called aposematic coloration. Aposematic coloration. To warn predators, I'm poisonous. But um, the warning, I'm actually not really sure how that works because uh, birds will eat frogs, of course. Um, they don't necessarily die though. They just get sick and then they won't eat them again. So I suppose that having, I mean, it could be innate also. It could be innate to recognize bright colors and then not eat whatever has those bright colors. But I think it's also a learned thing. I think in some cases, uh, an animal might try, like try to taste one and taste terrible, doesn't make it feel so good. So it doesn't eat it anymore. Does it work the opposite way for humans? Because when we see something colorful, we usually, we usually think that it's good to eat fruits or colorful absolutely and in most cases yeah yeah so for um predators that are herbivorous predators they're probably also looking for those bright berries yeah the bright fruits because they're ripe yeah that's a very good point um 
Mimicry takes on two different forms in, in, in uh, nature. In the case of Batesian mimicry, a harmless species mimics a harmful one. This is to me just bizarre. This is a, this is a snake. It's got these big eyes. Uh, no bird is going to try to eat this snake. Well, maybe a really super large one, but none of the smaller birds will. Um, I'm not sure what kind of snake this is, but it does look a little bit like a snake we saw in Costa Rica called an eyelash viper, which, you know, if it bit you, uh, you better have your snake remedy handy because they're very poisonous. Yeah, so, po so a poison, okay, poison is a chemical that um, is detrimental to a body. But venom, with a V, venom is a poison that's injected into the skin. So a venom is a poison, but a venom is a poison that's injected into the skin, which is what uh, some snakes do. But this is, this is a larva of a moth. And this is its back end. It's, it's rear end, it's bottom. <laughs> and if, if a bird comes along and tries to eat this larva, it's gonna think twice because it looks an awful lot like the snake. Very interesting style of mimicry. Malarian mimicry, if you're German, you'd pronounce it mu, mularian mimicry. There are two or more unpalatable species that resemble each other. So in this case, it's the cuckoo bee and the yellow jacket. They're very similar. Uh, they're both toxic to birds, but they also don't kill the birds. So what is the advantage of malarian mimicry? If you're both already unpalatable, why look like the other one, do you think? And, and they, they do live in similar habitats. What would be the advantage? So you've got two populations. And if you've got two different species, uh, you're likely to have them a little more widespread. So this is the hypothesis anyway, that birds, um, they will try one and it will make them sick, but it won't kill them, but they won't eat any other ones. So it is advantageous for to, there to be a lot of them and even two different species because a bird tries a cuckoo bee and it's not going to try another cuckoo bee or another yellow jacket. So that's why we think that Mullerian mimicry evolved. Herbivory. Herbivory is when an animal eats a plant. It's led to the evolution of plant mechanical and chemical defenses and adaptations by herbivores. Um, what are some examples? So what is an example of a plant defense? Poison. Plant. Poison. Yep, some plants can be quite toxic. I know some plants, um, they have like spines or something like, uh, it, it's to prevent like um, animals from eating the leaves, right? So they're prickly. Yeah, yeah, they're prickly, exactly. Uh, cacti have spines, uh, but a lot of other ones do too. Also thorns. And I read the other day what the difference was between thorns and spines. Now I don't remember. But a thorn usually, I think it's, I think a thorn comes from some other uh, organ of the plant. But they usually look something like that, the thorns. Like roses, you can identify roses because they have thorns. Say this is the, the branch here. 
Whereas spines, if it's a cacti, well, the spines, they're just straight. Just stick out as, uh, they are definitely modified leaves. Exactly. What kinds of herbivore adaptations are there? How could a herbivore get better at uh, finding and eating plants? Let's start with like their um, evolution sorry? through evolution. Yeah, so so uh, adaptations generally evolve because they're conducive to survival. Okay, so like giraffes have really long necks so they can eat sure. all the vegetation that's higher up that the other animals can't reach. Um, they long have, necks to reach. Yeah. Don't their jaws move side to side and they have flat teeth so they can grind plants better? Yeah, jaw movement. Um, molars. For grinding, yes. Uh, would herbivores require a good sense of smell? I think so. Maybe smell and sight, being able, to, being able to identify the edibles or being able to smell the edibles. Good. The very interesting thing is plants are quite, uh, they exhibit plasticity. In other words, they respond to herbivores. So for example, they may um, produce more poisonous chemicals in response to a herbivores coming along and, and chomping on their leaves or more spines. Parasitism is a kind of interaction where a parasite feeds on the host, which is harmed. Um, in this case, it was a wasp. The wasp laid eggs inside the um, caterpillar and these are the larvae that are coming out of the wasp. And the larvae have been eating, um, sorry, coming out of the caterpillar. The larvae have been eating the caterpillar. So this is a wasp, wasp, a caterpillar interaction. So the wasps lay eggs inside the caterpillar, which provides food for the larvae. And there's a really odd example that I included. No, I didn't. Um, there's an odd example where there's two different kinds of wasps. The first wasp lays the eggs, the larvae form inside the caterpillar. The second wasp lays the eggs inside the larvae inside the caterpillar. <laughs> That's bizarre, but true. That's why I have that written on my website, that nature is stranger than fiction. Biology is stranger than fiction. <laughs> Some biological processes can be quite wildly crazy. Disease uh, are caused by pathogens, such as bacteria, viruses, or protists. Mutualism is an interspecific reaction between different species that benefits both species. So in this case, this is a bit odd. These are aphids and ants. And yep, the ants is eating the poop of the aphid. 
But fortunately for the ant, the poop is all sugar. So the aphid, the, the ant is having a, a grand meal. But interestingly, the ants, what, what do you think? We know what the ant is getting out of this relationship. What is the, what is the aphid getting out of this relationship? Do you think? It's being cleaned, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really, I, 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 so no, that's a good guess. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the aphid can get into the, the foam of the plant and take out the sap and the sugar. Uh, the ants protect the aphids. I think often aphids uh, get protection. But there are also cases where the, the ants will pick the aphid up and move it to a new place to feed. So they move the aphids around. There's some interesting uh, fish, fish kinds of relationships, mutualism. Um, these fishes, mostly I think they're wrasses, but there's also different species. And they pick off the parasites off of the larger fish. So they both get a good deal out of that one. And commensalism, one species benefits, the other is not very affected. This uh, egret is getting a, a good view and probably is able to look out for predators more readily. And the cattle really don't affect, are not affected. So um, there is some evidence for coevolution. That's reciprocal genetic change by interacting populations. It's somewhat scarce to find, but it seems obvious when you look at species that live together so closely, like um, some of the mantids. Um, Eduardo was talking about mantids before, and there's some that are so closely related to the plant that they're on. When you're looking at the plant, you can't even tell that the, the mantis is there. And they're, they depend on each other. Yeah. So that's where I wanted to end. So thank you for watching. I will stop the recording.